Well, I'm a mathematician by training and a quantum scientist by application, but it wasn't always this way. I was as attracted to music as I was to mathematics, but I have way too much respect for music and musicians to inflict upon their craft my lack of talent and creativity. So I invested my time in mathematics, and I like to think that the things that I find attractive in math are exactly the same things I found tantalizing in music or art more generally. There's a rhythm inherent to mathematics, an attention to symmetry and aesthetics, which is captured in particular in geometry. And this is perhaps a large part of the reason why I became a geometer. It's my specialization within mathematics. Something else that fascinates me about mathematics is its universality. Regardless of the language we speak, concepts like one, two, and three persist across cultures and nations. We use numbers to tell our place in the world. Whether it's the, uh, the latitude and longitude of our city or village, the speed at which we're traveling, or the temperature outside. This universality makes mathematics the language of science. Amazingly, processes in nature, whether it's as close to home as the diffusion of a medicine in our bloodstream, or as grand as the orbit of the planets around the sun, these things can be understood, modeled with mathematics. I truly believe that to know mathematics is to know the universe. And for me, this is one of the most exciting parts of my job, to be able to understand and discover nature through the power of math. Where does quantum science come into this? Well, one of the really surprising discoveries of the early 20th century is that mathematical rules that govern the tiniest particles, the basic building blocks of nature, are radically different from the rules that govern the visible world, the world of our everyday experience. This realization was, of, was essentially the birth of quantum science, which really just means the science of the very tiny. Understanding the rules, the mathematics of these tiniest particles and building blocks means that we can sometimes bend those rules to make things happen that wouldn't normally happen. With this in mind, I have three goals. To convince you that quantum science is on the verge of changing your life. Two, to convince you that quantum science has already changed your life. And three, to convince you that the key to breaking new ground in quantum science may not be as scientific as you think. Let's start with two. I want to inform you about the truth that you're already using and in fact completely dependent upon quantum technologies. Allow me to demonstrate. That's better. What you just witnessed were a few seconds of living without arguably the oldest and certainly the most pervasive and abundant of quantum technology, electricity, and through it, the controlled emission of light. This is a quantum technology because it harnesses the behavior of tiny quantum particles. First of all, electrons, which are moved or conducted across wires, and then ultimately photons emitted as a result of this energy transfer to create the effect that we call light. You can't see with your naked eye the electrons moving in these wires. Visibly, the wire does not appear to have changed, but there's a physical process occurring inside them, a process we are now completely dependent upon. This technology has always been quantum at its core, but miraculously, humanity had discovered, adapted, and disseminated this technology without any knowledge of quantum science. That level of understanding came much later, not until the early 20th century. However, I can't think of a more profound example of how quantum technology has changed the very fabric of our everyday life and existence. Humanity, for most of its existence, lived under the tyranny of darkness and the loss of control that it brings with it, rendering us unable to decide for ourselves when the day would start and the night would begin. To those who lived their lives via candlelight, we would appear to be magicians, able to control light with the flick of a switch. Today, to the chagrin of those who study the night sky, we have now all but eliminated darkness, our world filled with the glimmer of cities and the buzz of people who never sleep. Now that I've convinced you that quantum technologies are everywhere, I want to name a couple more innovations that we rely upon. One literally fits into the palm of your hand and you carry it everywhere you go. Your smartphone contains as many as 2.5 billion transistors, tiny devices that take advantage of quantum effects to route and amplify electrical signals. What we take for granted today in terms of computer functionality, near instantaneous communication, would be impossible without the quantum tech of transistors. Something that doesn't quite fit in your hand, 
but is equally quantum, is an MRI machine, which uses the so-called spins of quantum particles to help image pathologies in our bodies and ultimately save lives. Even with these technologies already in place, quantum technology is going through an exciting revolution. Perhaps the most anticipated technology here is quantum computing. Now, you may be satisfied with the computer that currently sits on your desk, but remember the folks who lived their lives by candlelight. The candle was a great invention, and they probably asked themselves, how can it get any better? <laughs> quantum computers are to today's computers as the light bulb is to the candle. You've probably heard before that the data in a computer is made up of zeros and ones. Whether it's an email that you're writing or a movie that you're streaming, it all gets reduced mathematically to zeros and ones. We can think of zero as off and one as on, and so the state of your computer at any time is a long sequence of billions or trillions of switches set in a deliberate way to on or off. But quantum computers store their data in the states of quantum particles, which are more like dimmer switches than on-off switches. You can be on, off, or anywhere in between. And so a single quantum switch can encode far more information than a traditional one. Prototype quantum computers already exist and are helping us to solve problems where there are tremendously many variables at play, such as supply chain optimization or drug discovery, properly, uh, pro problems that are hopeless on today's computers. Quantum computing will change life as we know it, just like moving from the candle to the light bulb. For quantum computing to really take off, we need new innovations in electronics and materials. Like any good science and engineering, these innovations require creative leaps, using materials in ways that were not previously imagined, and daring to believe that something is possible when our experience so far seems to indicate otherwise. And this brings us back to art, as in some ways that's exactly what art attempts to do. We like to silo science and art from one another, but I truly believe that they are two sides of the same coin. There's a lot of art inspired by science, but we have to give credit to science inspired by art. To come back to music, so much of what we know scientifically today about sound waves and acoustics has been motivated by music over millennia. In the same way, art can motivate new paradigms for quantum technologies. I want to illustrate this. Let's go back to that basic technology of electrical conductivity. Mathematicians and physicists like to think in terms of models. Discreetly, you can imagine electrical conductivity as electrons, those individual particles of electric charge, hopping along a wire. But we can go one step further and think about two-dimensional conductors, like a thin plate or film. And here we can think about electrons hopping from square to square. You might ask, why squares? Well, that's a good question, a question a mathematician might ask, because there are other ways to tile two-dimensional space. Your model could be of electrons hopping from hexagon to hexagon, and there are materials like this. You might ask if the cells could be octagons. Can we do that? Let's try that out. Hmm, it looks like it doesn't quite work. There's always going to be some empty space between the octagons that can't quite be filled in. So you might think then that such materials might therefore be impossible. But let's think like an artist instead of a mathematician. What you see here is one of the famous woodcuts by the mid-20th century artist M.C. Escher. This is secretly a tiling of space. It uses warped cells rather than regular ones to achieve unusual tilings. So let's apply this thinking to our conducting material, which would now look something like this. This is a schematic of what we call a hyperbolic material, in which the octagons get smaller and smaller as you move away from the center, but now they can be packed together. Electrons move differently here, and so the material conducts differently. And these can be actually engineered synthetically now. This opens up doors for components of quantum computers and other revolutionary devices, with the hope of making them as commonplace as your smartphones. A lot of the mathematics behind this idea was worked out right here in Saskatchewan and in Alberta with my collaborators. But this idea wasn't born in a lab, and it reflects what artists have already been thinking about, picturing geometry in new and daring ways. So what's the moral of the story? Be bold, think artistically, apply mathematically and scientifically,
And through this, we can play a small part in bringing to life ideas that will shape the future for the better. Now let's honor the magic in science and flick the switch. Thank you.